thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so yes, as mentioned, we are here to talk about some really interesting stuff that's going on in the world. Uh, fake news, hate speech, viral content, and one thing they all share in common, which is traffic generation. So just uh, as a way of a little bit of introduction here, uh, AppNexus has a team of data scientists who focus on all sorts of problems pertaining to quality, such as viral content, tr not even traffic, all the content policies, everything that we have to keep track of. And uh, Laura is joining me on stage today. She's on the team with me. Uh, and our job is to use data science techniques to identify this problem and enforce it where we can. What's really interesting about it is that it's an unsupervised problem. And what we mean by that is we don't get a phone call from the KGB at the end of the month telling us how many bots we identified or news websites we took out or whatever. I wish we did. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, so we don't have labels for doing a lot of classic supervised machine learning. So we have to rely on using unsupervised approaches such as clustering, information retrieval, all sorts of really exploratory, very interesting techniques, and generate labeled data whenever we can. Um, so that brings us to sort of the topic of fake news. And one of the things that it's been in everyone's mind right now, and as well it should be, it's a very important topic. However, one of the things that we noticed about fake news is that it tends to share a lot in common with something we're pretty familiar with, which is uh, viral content, low effort, clickbait, traffic generation, pay-per-click schemes. They all are sort of in the same genre of things, the same sort of way of generating traffic. And the model of this is pretty straightforward. You just want to get people to your site as cheaply as possible. And maybe that means you write salacious headlines, like you won't believe what's on someone's birth certificate. Or maybe it means something like you hire someone to write low quality articles for you. Maybe you just steal someone else's content. Maybe you buy visitors, and sometimes they're bots. There's all different ways of doing it. Whatever you want to do, you want to minimize the cost and keep the ad revenue. That's the name of the game. So it turns out, somewhat to our surprise, uh, but also we were happy about it, is that a lot of the things uh, that we do to detect botnets work really well to identify the same genre of content and allow us to have a handle on the problem. So we also noticed one other thing that goes along with this is that when you're doing one of the forms of traffic generation, you're also often engaged in multiple. So we have sort of an add-on effect where we're able to detect multiple things going at the same time. And Laura is actually going to bring us through some really interesting, exciting examples of some stuff we've seen out in the wild. Thanks, Michael. So as Michael mentioned, these types of websites have a lot in common, whether it's they're featuring fake news or more general viral content. And that's because they're all playing the same sort of games. They want to invest as little as possible into creating their website's content while still bringing in some amount of human visitors and also being able to pass audit, whether that's a buyer who's checking their domain list or a platform like AppNexus that's also reviewing their domains. So you might see things like really, really big pictures and only a tiny bit of content. And when you look at that content, maybe it's been scraped from other websites or they've hired an army of people to write short, low quality articles. You might also see clickbait headlines, whether that's apolitical or more outrageous political content, listicles, um, and it might also be hard to tie these websites back to actual people. So rather than actual people's names on the articles, you'll see things like contributor or author. And I've got some examples in the next few slides to kind of illustrate this more in depth. But before I do that, I want to pause and note why these websites are risky. It's not just because of their content, although that content itself might be objectionable, it's also what the content says about these websites. So if I'm a really premium publisher, I'm going to work really hard to create great content that readers are going to want to come back to time and time again, the types of websites that you check first thing in the morning. These other types of websites, though, they don't have that organic readership that comes back time and time again. So they're constantly in need of new visitors. And they're getting those with things like clickbait headlines and listicles. But if one day those tricks don't work, they might turn to more nefarious tactics, like non-human traffic, automatic redirects, and pop-unders. So now I'm going to show you some examples of what this looks like. So this first example, what's kind of the first thing that you notice? It's probably that the picture is exactly the same. If you look a little bit more closely, you'll also notice that the entire content of these articles is the same. But what's different? Well, one of these is a brand that you probably have heard of. It's a premium publisher. The other is a website that maybe you've never heard of. You'll also notice that on the premium publisher, we've actually got a person's name. And on the other website, we just have contributor. 
So this is an example of potential content scraping. This second publisher hasn't really invested the time and effort to create their own original content. They've just got a website that's mostly populated by things they've taken from other locations. This next example is kind of interesting because the first time that you look at it, you might think, is this a Los Angeles Times competitor I've never heard of? Maybe you're a little suspicious because the font's kind of weird. But overall, at first glance, it looks somewhat legitimate on the home page. Navigate around, though, and you'll notice there are entire sections of the website that actually don't have any content at all. We also found on this website broken code, so you could actually see exposed HTML. And again, these aren't things that on a premium publisher's website you'd expect. They're gonna spend a lot of time and effort making sure that anywhere a reader goes, they're gonna find interesting things to explore. So this is another kind of telltale sign that things aren't quite right. This last example actually features a bar at the top that tells you where they have scraped content from, probably without these publish publishers' knowledge. Um, and if you look at the articles themselves, they haven't even bothered to scrape the entire content. We've just kind of got a little snippet that doesn't really pass scrutiny if you're looking at it. We've also got contributor again, rather than an actual person's name, and a mysterious little link. It might be a little hard to read, but if you look at the orange, there's a happy will link that leads to another website that doesn't really seem related. So these are all examples of things we're seeing out there right now. But if you're an ad tech industry veteran, you may remember a few years ago, people didn't even go to these links. You'd actually just see completely blank websites with tons of ads just stuffed on the page. The reason that you see things like this now is buyers have gotten more sophisticated and platforms like AppNexus have also gotten more sophisticated. So their tactics have had to evolve. That's why it's important to have tools and techniques that can detect these types of websites no matter how they change and across different content, whether it's fake news or just more general viral content. So Michael's gonna talk to us a little bit now about one of the specific techniques we use to find these websites and more generally how AppNexus can have an effect on this ecosystem. Thanks, Laura. Well, that's some bad stuff. <laughs> so it's an interesting problem. Uh, so those are some of the things that we can find, that we know about, that we've seen. And the question is, what can we do about it? Uh, so there are at least uh, three main ways that I think that we can do something about this problem. Uh, one of the first ones is pretty obvious, which is don't pay an advertiser if they bought something they shouldn't. That's a thing we do, fairly straightforward. Um, another thing we can also do is control who is allowed to be a publisher on the platform or control payments to a publisher. So you may remember there was a Bach on ads post about terminating publishers, like that's that whole basket of items. The third thing is to look at the stream of data that comes to us in the form of impression requests. And this is where the data science part is really interesting and where we get involved. And, well, we're involved in all of it, but we're especially interested in, interested in that section. And that is what allows us to find a lot of the, the fake news and the political viral content. Also, we find things like pop under advertisements from large format ad networks. Um, we also find a lot of things from sort of your classic botnets and just the usual. And there's one thing in particular we like to do quite a bit that allows us to use this data in a way that's tremendously impactful called co-visitation. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit. Um, but first, <clears throat> let's sort of look at maybe what could be a potential possible business model for how this may take place. So obviously AppNexus is the orange circle there on the upper left, and we have our publisher client who's represented in purple, and we have our advertiser who's in green. What could happen in a particular scenario is that that publisher there may be interested in acquiring more visitors for a site, so they may acquire visitors from a pay-per-click ad exchange. And what could happen is the publisher may accidentally end up acquiring some non-human traffic because someone mixed it in to the pay-per-click exchange they're buying from. So it's a very high-risk situation. Uh, and then AppNexus, we're going to see this data, we're going to see this effect when we have the stream of impression requests that come to our platform. So in this way, we end up being a bit like doctors, where someone might come into us and say, I've got a problem, can you help me fix it? And we have to sort of look through the symptoms and figure out what is the actual underlying cause, where sometimes it may be something benign, other times it may be something more nefarious. So we have to have a very close look at the impression data that we see. And so these are the three places I mentioned earlier where we really have the ability to make any sort of actions. But our goal as data scientists is try to infer what the existence of this arrangement is and try to understand what we can about the structure and nature of the business relationships that exist for a given publisher. Um, now, I should also mention, of course, this is only one possible variant, and you can imagine that there are many, many, many different ways this could be set up, or different you know, parties who may be involved, or this or that, so it's a very complex, interesting thing. And I was mentioning earlier, we do this thing called co-visitation. So this is what it looks like. And 
to give you a clue about what it is, on the left side there, we have this website, uh, momtaxi.com, which is a website that is engaging in the non-political but low effort viral content game. And it actually was part a target of a botnet that we identified on our platform fairly recently and eliminated. One of the things that you can see, if you look in the, the middle column there, it lists all of the sites that users who visited Mom Taxi also visited. And one of the things you notice is that they have um, the score next to each of them, and we can see what the highest ranking co-visiting websites are. And if you look at all of them, you can infer that they have a low effort viral content shenanigans kind of stuff going on here, and they're bad. <laughs> so uh, this is sort of the non-political variant, and this is sort of our anti-botnet technology, which works, works very well. But let's take a look at a site with risky political content. And now in this case, uh, we have a website of interest, sarahpalinnews.com, and we observe, well, what do you see? Well, when we look at this, what we see is the profile looks very similar. The numbers are a little bit different, but what's important here is that all of the sites form a very tight cluster of the same genre of content. And it's worth pointing out that in this particular example, we happen to be talking about something that is politically oriented towards the right. Um, we also observe the same thing on left-wing sites. We also observe it in other languages, so it's not just limited to English. But it has the same exact effect in our data because they're doing the same thing. They're doing traffic generation. They're trying to get people to share, trying to get people to click. They're not putting a lot of work into it. It's pretty, it shows up exactly the same way as you might for botnet. So that's the tool we have at our disposal, for one of the tools we have at our disposal. And it works really, really well. We found a lot of stuff doing this. So it's very exciting. So fake news, hate speech, and more generally viral content are really difficult topics to tackle because the distinctions between them aren't always clear. It's not always easy to, to tell the difference between fake news, highly slanted but still technically true political content, and even satire. Similarly, with viral content, you have everything from really terribly written, low quality viral sites that really no human's ever going to read, to very high end premium publishers who are still dabbling in viral content here and there. These are areas that UpNexus cares deeply about and we're investing heavily in with state of the art machine learning for automated content analysis to look for things like clickbait, content scraping, fake news, and hate speech. We're also really fortunate that many of our existing non-human traffic te technologies work very well to catch these types of sites. AppNexus is also in a unique position in the ecosystem with unique data assets that allow us to spot trends that others can't. So by combining our existing investments in proprietary non-human traffic technologies with our new investments in automated content analysis, AppNexus is able to tackle problems like fake news and hate speech from multiple angles. So if you're a buyer, Know that this is something we're thinking deeply about so that you can continue to buy with confidence. And if you're a premium publisher working hard to create really good content, know that we're working hard to make sure that you're rewarded for your efforts. And if you're that other type of publisher who's trying to game the system with clickbait headlines or fake news to gain a quick buck, we're on to you. Because it's in all of our best interests to create a better internet. Thanks very much.